and uh, turn to Acts chapter 2. And I want to read our scripture and then we'll, we'll pray together. Acts chapter 2 beginning with verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, and some translations read, fully come. They were all together in one place. Talking about the disciples of Jesus. And suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire. Uh, today I'm hoping to deal with that symbolism. Amen. But there appeared to them. It's amazing. The, the sound was like a, 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 a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house. Amen. And then there appeared tongues as of fire. Don't you think that's an, don't you find that interesting? Tongues as of fire distributing themselves and they rested on each one of them. I like that. Verse 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues. And uh, my Bible has a marginal note and it says languages languages and what he's talking about there is, is foreign languages you know, a, a variety of languages used by uh, various people groups or races or nations and so they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other languages as the Spirit was giving them utterance or the ability to speak. So the, the, the languages that they were speaking, the tongues, were not languages that they knew naturally. They were not languages that were proper to them. Instead, they were supernaturally empowered to speak these languages. Isn't that interesting? If that were to happen in most places, it would scare the kajibers out of us. Whatever that is. Verse 5. Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in, their, in his own language. So... Uh, some of the people understood those languages. Right? right? Yeah. And uh, were, were bewildered. They were amazed because they were hearing these, the 120 uh, praising God and, and declaring His mighty acts in their own language. And yet they knew from their appearance that they were not of their race. So they knew something, there was an unusual phenomenon taking place. A miraculous thing was occurring. They were amazed and astonished. Saying, Why are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Pergia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them in our own tongues, speaking of the mighty deeds of God. I mean, you see, they were speaking in other languages and prophesying or declaring the, the mighty deeds of God. Everybody say that's wonderful. Verse 12. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity. Saying to one another. What does this mean? But others were mocking and saying. They are full 
of sweet wine. In other words, some of them didn't understand the language and just thought they were drunk or that they were insane. And Paul talks about uh, this problem in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 when he talks about language, speaking in tongues. Amen? All right, let's pray together. Stretch your hand out toward me, would you? And you agree with me in prayer. Father, we, we thank you for the inscripturated word which is able to make us wise unto salvation and to, to grow up into the head in everything. We lift up the name of Jesus over this part of our service. And in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we take authority over every territorial spirit and every demonic power and we bind you and forbid you to hinder or to interfere with the going forth of the word of the kingdom. And Father, we... we we call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. And in Jesus' name, we ask for the help of the Holy Spirit. Everybody say, come Holy Spirit. Say it again. Come Holy Spirit. One more time. Come Holy Spirit. Anoint your servant. Help him to speak as you want him to speak. In, by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, anoint the hearers. Give each one of us ears to hear and hearts to believe. Take any hardness from our hearts. And grant us grace that we might benefit greatly from everything that's said and everything that's done. In Jesus' name, amen. We're talking about understanding the baptism and receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit for supernatural power to live the authentic Christian life. Now that's a mouthful. Last week we saw that receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit is not automatic. God's wonderful gift of power must be personally received. How many of you understand this morning that God wants to give you the gift of the Holy Spirit? Without measure. He wants to give each one of you. If, if you're born again. If you're a child of God. It's his will. To give you. The Holy Spirit. Without measure. But he won't force that gift on you. The Holy Spirit's indwelling presence. And his supernatural power in your life is a gift. And just like salvation, the gift of the Holy Spirit must be received. And we saw last week that the Holy Spirit can be resisted. He can be refused or rejected. He can be neglected. And he can be grieved. Also last week, we began to look at the apostolic or the New Testament pattern for receiving the gift of the Spirit that's found in the book of, of Acts. We saw, first of all, the basic or the primary pattern for receiving the gift of, of the Spirit, which is found in Acts chapter 2, Verses 1 through 4. We're not going to go through that again. But I, I remind you that, that Acts 2 verses 1 through 4 is Luke's historical account of how the 120 in the upper room in Jerusalem received the promise of the Father. 
I pointed out to you that they'd already been baptized by Jesus in water for salvation. But they waited in the upper room until the day of Pentecost had fully arrived. And just as Jesus had promised them, the Holy Spirit was poured out upon them and they were all filled with the power of God and spoke in tongues. I'm wanting you to connect the power of God with speaking in tongues or foreign languages that they had not learned. And as they spoke in tongues, they were actually exalting or glorifying God. They were prophesying, church. Now, I, I shared with you last week that this is the primary pattern. For receiving the gift of the Spirit. First, we get ourselves baptized uh, into, in water in the name of Jesus Christ in order to receive salvation. Our sins are forgiven. Our hearts are quickened and made alive to God. And then we receive the gift of the Spirit for power. To enable us to work the works of Jesus and live the life of faith. A life of love and a life of obedience. Just like Jesus lived. Isn't that wonderful? We also saw the second example or model for receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 verses 36 through 41. I mean, how many of you remember that? After Peter had preached the gospel of the kingdom to his fellow Israelites, 3,000 Jewish men received his message and obeyed his word and got themselves baptized in water into the name of Jesus Christ for salvation. Peter also had promised them that they would not only receive the forgiveness of sins, they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Right? But we're not told whether the 3,000 received the gift of the Spirit automatically as at, at, at the moment they were baptized or saved or whether they received the Spirit after they had been baptized or saved. But the third example or model Luke gives us in Acts chapter 8 verses 14 through 17 explains that mystery. Right? We saw in Acts chapter 8 verses 14 through 17 that the Samaritans did not receive the gift of the Holy Spirit automatically when they had uh, obeyed the gospel and gotten themselves baptized into Jesus Christ for salvation. Instead, you remember, they had to wait until the apostles, till Peter and John came down from Jerusalem and prayed for them to, to be able to receive the Holy Spirit and then laid their hands upon them and they received the gift of the Holy Spirit. And I, sh I, I, I shared with you that the point of that, of Acts 8, verses 14 through 17, is that contrary to what many believe today, the gift of the Holy Spirit is not automatically received when a person gets baptized into Jesus Christ for salvation. Now, turn to Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10. And we pick up where we left off last week. Everybody say, uh, Bishop is sharing a, the pattern for receiving the gift of the Spirit. See, so you need to make notes so you can follow my instructions, right? <laughs> Let's say it one more time. Uh, we're looking at the pattern. For receiving the gift of the Spirit. For receiving the gift of the Spirit. 
Now, most of you here have already received the Spirit. But you need to know how to help someone else receive the Holy Spirit. Maybe there are others here who haven't received the Spirit. And if you haven't, you need to understand the pattern. You need to know how to receive your birthright. Amen? Acts chapter 10. Uh, I, I don't want you to, to start reading yet. Let, because I, I want to set it up for you. Acts chapter 10 is Luke's account. You'll remember this as I remind you. Luke's account of Peter's ministry to Cornelius in the city of, of Caesarea. How many of you remember Cornelius? Yes. Yes. He's a Roman centurion. A powerful Roman citizen. And he, he's living in the city of Caesarea. And God sends his angel to Cornelius. And he commands Cornelius, a Gentile, to send to Joppa. Joppa's on the coast of, of uh, the land of Palestine. Not too far from the city of Jerusalem. And it's, it's still in existence today. So uh, God sends his angel and the angel commands Cornelius to send to Joppa for Simon Peter. To come to Caesarea and preach the gospel of the kingdom to, to him and to his household. The very next day, the scriptures tell us that God gives Peter a vision. He's up on the housetop praying and he gets a vision. Remember the, the, the sheet is, comes down out of heaven and it's full of all kinds of, of unclean animals. Yes. And the, uh, the God commands Peter, rise and eat. And Peter responds, no, Lord. I mean, no, that's a contradiction. No, Lord. <laughs> Because I've never eaten anything that was common or unclean. And uh, God instructs Peter not to call what he's cleansed common or unholy or unclean. Now I wonder why God did that. But well, we're going to see in just a moment. Immediately... The, the Holy Spirit instructs Peter to go with Cornelius' messengers to Cornelius' house. And Peter goes to Caesarea. He enters Cornelius' house. He preaches the gospel of the kingdom to Cornelius and to his household. We assume he preached to them the same thing he preached to the Jews on the day of Pentecost. Now, let's turn to Acts chapter 10. And let's read starting with verse 44. Acts 10 starting with verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words. In other words, Peter's in mid-stride. He's in the midst of, of, of prophesying or proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. Isn't that amazing? Yes. All the circumcised believers, this is talking about the Jewish believers, who came with Peter were amazed. Yes. Because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Hallelujah. Yes. You know, he shouldn't, they shouldn't have been amazed because on the day of Pentecost, Peter told them that the gift of the Holy Spirit was not only for the Jews and for their children, but for the Gentiles, for as many who were afar off. But obviously, he had forgotten. I mean, you know, oftentimes we forget what we've just prophesied. You know that's the truth. I've had people tell me, God told me he wants me to join this church. And then a week or two weeks later, God told me to leave this church. Obviously, God gets confused. Or he forgets what he has said. 
How many of you hear what I'm saying to you? You know, oftentimes what we prophesy, we're prophesying out of our own spirit. And we're prophesying what we want to do. Rather than what God is really telling us to do. Now, I know none of you do that. I'm talking about those other prophets down the street. So all, all the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they were hearing them, watch, they were hearing them speaking with tongues or foreign languages that they had never learned and exalting God or prophesying. Then Peter answered, Surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did. Remember, we're talking about the pattern. And he ordered them to be baptized. Underline those words. He ordered them. He ordered them. in, In one place, the Apostle Paul says, to the the Corinthians, do you want me to come with a rod? Or do you want me to come to you in love? You know, if if a minister were to say something like that to a modern church, the response would be, we don't want you to come at all. Church, how many understand? There are commands in the New Testament. There's the the, the kingdom of God is a kingdom, not a democracy. There are commandments for you and I to obey. You're not your own. If if you have been baptized into Jesus Christ, then you belong to Him. And you're not free to do whatever you please. You're only free to obey the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. Surely. And, And so He ordered them to be baptized in or into the name of Jesus Christ. Then they ask him to stay on for a few days. Now stop reading for a moment. This is amazing to me, church. Even while Peter is in the midst of preaching the gospel of the king, the Holy Spirit falls on Cornelius and all those in his household who had been listening to Peter's message. Now, what I want you to see is these were were, uh, people who were old enough or mature enough to listen and to understand the message that were being spoken. So this is not talking about babies. Oh, hallelujah. I just threw that in. That's free. So while Peter's preaching, the Holy Spirit falls on Cornelius and all of those in his household who had been listening to Peter's message. And they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And they're filled with power. My God, church. And because of that power, they speak in tongues. In a foreign language that they had not learned before that. And just, and they they glorify God. They exalt God together. Or they prophesy. Just like Peter and the 120 did on the day of Pentecost. Is that not powerful to you? Now watch this. Watch carefully. Because on the surface... This passage appears to contradict the the kingdom or apostolic pattern for receiving the gift of the Spirit that we've seen in Acts 2 and in Acts chapter 8. But in reality, on closer examination, it really doesn't. Instead, this was simply an exception to the rule. In other words, Acts chapter 10 is not the rule. It's not the pattern for how you and I receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's the exception to the rule. In fact, this is the only place in the the book of Acts or in the epistles or the entire New Testament where anyone received the Holy Spirit before he was baptized in water for salvation. Is that good? 
Everybody say amen or oh me. Amen. Now what I want you to see is the reason that Cornelius and his household received the gift of the Spirit before they were baptized in water for salvation in accordance with the, the apostolic pattern that we've seen in Acts 2 and Acts 8 is simply because Cornelius and the members of his household were Gentiles. Everybody say they were Gentiles. And God knew. How many of you believe God knew Peter's heart? Come on. How many of you believe he knew the heart of those other Jewish Christians who were with him? And because he knew their heart, he knew the deep-seated prejudice that Peter and those other Jewish Christians had against Gentiles. And because of that, God knew that Peter and those other Jewish Christians would never offer baptism or extend salvation to Cornelius and the members of this Gentile soldier's household. In fact, Peter started off his message when he got to Cornelius' house, he, he began in verse 28 by telling Cornelius that it was against the law of Moses for a Jew to associate with Gentiles or to even visit in a, a, a Gentile home. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So, even as Peter's preaching, watch this, even as Peter's preaching, at the very point that Cornelius and his household understood and believed the gospel of Jesus the Messiah, the Lord God Almighty, the Father, sovereignly filled them with the Holy Ghost and with power. And they all spoke in tongues or foreign languages and prophesied or magnified and exalted the Lord. Whew. The point, church, is that receiving the gift of the Spirit is the proof, the proof or the evidence that Peter needed in order to know for certain that Cornelius and his household had truly been cleansed of their sins and accepted by God through Jesus Christ for salvation. In other words, the gift of the Holy Spirit was God's seal of approval. It was the spirit of adoption that enabled those Gentiles to, to say, Abba, Father. And as a result, as a result, knowing that they had been accepted by God, in verse 48, Peter commands, commands Cornelius and his household to complete their initiation into Jesus and his kingdom by getting themselves baptized in water into the name of Jesus Christ. Thus fulfilling all righteousness by obeying God's command or God's decree for everyone to be baptized into the name of his dear son for salvation. How many of you hear what I'm saying? Now, there are people today that receive the Holy Spirit before they repent and get themselves baptized. But just because that, that happens doesn't mean that's the pattern. Amen? How many understand God can do whatever He wants? You know, He's got my permission. Not that He needs it. How many of you hear what I'm saying? God can do what he wants. But, but there is a pattern that has, is laid out for us in the book of Acts. A primary pattern for receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. Finally, uh, Acts chapter 19. Take your Bible and look at Acts chapter 19. This is Luke's last his, historical example of the pattern, the apostolic pattern or the, the kingdom pattern for receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit for power. For kingdom power. Acts chapter 19. I want us to begin reading with, with the first verse. Acts chapter 19. 
It happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the upper country and came to Ephesus and found some disciples. Underline those words, found some disciples. He said to them, <laughs> listen, look at this, circle verse 2. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, no. We have not even heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance. Telling the people to believe in him who was coming after him. That is, in Jesus. Verse 5. When they heard this, watch this. They were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. This is just like Acts 2 and just like Acts 8. Yes. Amen? Amen. And, and these are Jews again. Yes. And when they heard this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Verse 6, And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And they began speaking with tongues or foreign languages and prophesying. There were in all about 12 men. Now stop reading. Stop reading for a moment. Paul goes to Ephesus. Watch this. And he finds... Some disciples. Only they're John's disciples. John the Baptist. But Paul recognizes that he doesn't know this yet. He thinks they're Christians. But he, he, he recognizes that something is missing in their lives. Maybe it was because they did not speak in tongues or foreign languages that they hadn't learned. Or they didn't prophesy. Maybe it was because they did not move in miracles or the supernatural power of God like spirit-filled Christians should, yes. can, and should. Yes. Amen? Maybe it was because they lacked joy. They acted more like they'd been baptized in pickle juice. than into the kingdom of, of heaven. Or, or maybe it was because they did not manifest the love of God the Father or the fruit of the Spirit in their life. Whatever it was, for whatever reason, Paul realized they did not have the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. And therefore, he questions their initiation into Messiah's kingdom. Are you with me? Yes. He asked them, Have you received the Holy Spirit? Received the Spirit since you believed? What I want you to see is that Paul understood, watch this, that receiving the gift of the Spirit is the birthright of every baptized or born again believer in Jesus Christ. Amen? And so he asked them, he, he, he senses that they lack the Spirit. So he says, uh, have you received the Spirit since you believed? And John's disciples respond that they hadn't even heard about the gift of the Holy Spirit. It sounds like some Christians today. And so Paul inquires further and discovers that they're John's disciples. And that all they had was a baptism of repentance. And so Luke tells us that Paul preaches Jesus to them. Yes. And then he baptizes them in water. Yes. Into the name of Jesus Christ for salvation. Yes. Then, you know, after they've been baptized for salvation, then Paul lays his hands on them. Yes. Are you there? Oh, yes. And the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And they're filled with supernatural power. And begin 
speaking in tongues or languages. You're going to see in a moment why I'm emphasizing that, these, that tongues are languages. And they're, so they, they, they begin speaking in tongues and prophesying. Is that not powerful? Now, what I want you to see in this church is that receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit for power, for supernatural power in your life, is essential to being able to live a supernatural or authentic Christian life. I'm talking about the life that Jesus lived. You see, brothers and sisters, you and I can't live the Christian life without power. We can't live the Christian life without the gift of the Holy Spirit. You can't work the works of Jesus or live the life of Jesus without being clothed upon by the power of the Spirit and filled with the love and the power of God. Is that not good? Now watch. Today there are many wonderful. Please hear what I'm saying. Wonderful, great, evangelical Christians who are like the Samaritans. They've repented. They've believed the gospel. They've been baptized in water. Baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. But they've never... And by the way, I'm not arguing whether we're to be baptized in the name of Jesus only or in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You understand what I'm saying? What I'm arguing is we need to be baptized into Jesus Christ. Into His death. And... Buried with him in water baptism. And we need to be raised up into his resurrection life. Into his kingdom. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And there are many evangelicals who have done that. But, like the Samaritans, they've never received the gift of the Spirit. Are you there? Yeah. And sadly, they assume that they have all that they need. Or all that is available to them to live the authentic Christian life. Yes, but I would suggest that like the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8, they need to call for Peter and John yes. or the apostles to pray for them and to lay hands on them to receive the gift of the Father. Yes. Amen? But not only that, sadly, there are also many great, wonderful Pentecostal and charismatic Christians who are like Cornelius. They've received the gift of the Holy Spirit. But they've never fully obeyed the gospel by getting themselves baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. They need to obey Peter's command in Acts 10 48 and they need to get themselves baptized in water in the name in order to fulfill all righteousness and complete their initiation into Jesus the Messiah and into his new covenant hallelujah is that good church now the seventh thing that I want you to see. Now, For those of you, who, this is your first session with us. I've, I've laid out six different things that we need to understand if we're going to understand the baptism of the Spirit and what it means to receive the gift, okay? And uh, the, the sixth thing was the pattern for receiving the Spirit. The seventh thing that I want you to see, if you're making notes, you want to write this down is the scriptural evidence. The scriptural evidence or the proof that we've actually received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? Yeah. How many understand the point? Yeah. You see, church, the big question this morning is how do you and I know that we've received the gift of the Holy Spirit? 
What is the scriptural evidence or the proof of having received the gift of the Holy Spirit? Well, Luke records in Acts 2 verses 1 through 4 that the 120... Remember, we read that at the beginning of the service. The 120 spoke in tongues. Remember? They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they all, or with the power of God, and they all spoke in tongues or foreign languages that they had not studied or learned uh, previously. And they also prophesied or declared or proclaimed the mighty acts of God. In fact, the sound was so noisy and so loud that a great multitude gathered. And many of their fellow Jews thought they were drunk. Oh, hallelujah. Evidently, Peter and the others, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, were feeling pretty good. Right? But the point I want you to see is that according to Luke... The disciples' experience of receiving the gift of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost was a definite experience. It was a definite experience. The disciples knew when they had received. But not only was it definite, it was also demonstrable. That is to say, there was a manifestation or a demonstration of supernatural, miraculous power. As Peter and the others spoke in tongues or languages and prophesied. Those around them both saw and heard the manifestation of the Spirit's power. Is that good? The same thing is true in Acts 8. Luke tells us that when Peter and John, watch this, laid their hands on the Samaritans, that Simon the magician actually saw them receive. What did he see? He probably saw them speaking in tongues and heard them. Hallelujah. 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 Just as for the 120 in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, receiving the gift of the Spirit was a definite and demonstrable experience for the Samaritans. Amen. Everybody say definite. definite. Say demonstrable. demonstrable. There's going to be a manifestation of supernatural power. Yes. Glory. That's why the Spirit's given is for power. Yes. Glory. And I'm about to come to that point, which will be in my conclusion. Also in Acts 10, Luke tells us that when Cornelius and his Gentile household received the gift of the Holy Spirit, Peter and the Jewish Christians with them heard them speaking in tongues and exalting God or prophesying. Exactly the same way that Peter and his fellow Jews had received or had done on the day of Pentecost. Finally, in Acts 19, when the Ephesians received the gift of the Spirit, Luke tells us they also spoke in tongues and prophesied. How many of you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. Wave at me if you, you understand what's being said. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What I want you to see is whether we understand it or not, or whether we like it or not. I mean, you know, there's some things God does I don't necessarily like. But I found he seldom asks me what I like. <laughs> Somehow he thinks he's God. <laughs> Hallelujah. But whether we understand it or not, or whether we like it or not, according to the acts of the apostles, the evidence or proof that you and I have received the gift of the Spirit is speaking in tongues. Languages of men and angels, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, that we have not learned, and also that we prophesy, or that we declare the mighty acts of God in Jesus the Messiah. Finally, the last thing. This is the eighth point. 
If you've been with me the whole time, you're making notes. You getting good notes, Jeremy? <laughs> Jeremy, Jeremy makes great notes. The eighth point, or the last thing that I want you to understand about the, the baptism of the Spirit and receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit is the place, watch this, the place or the significance or the vital importance of speaking in tongues. Remember, I'm talking about foreign languages that you haven't learned. And prophesying. The place or the significance, the vital importance of speaking in tongues and prophesying in the life of the individual believer and in the life of the church. How many of you would like to understand that? You remember that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost was accompanied with tongues of fire that actually sat upon the heads. Everybody say tongues. In other words, these, the, the fire looked like tongues. How many understand your tongue is the, the, your organ of speech? And communication. This is, this is so important, church. And nobody preaches on it. So, the outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost was accompanied with tongues of fire that actually sat upon the heads of the 120 in the upper room in Jerusalem. Watch this. Not just on the heads of the apostles. Hallelujah. But upon the head of Mary. The mother of Jesus. Well, of course you would expect that, wouldn't you? But also upon the heads of each one of the other 120. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many understand that the power of the Holy Spirit is the birthright of every believer? Yeah. To give us power. Amen. To communicate yes. the gospel of the King. To one another in the church and to the world. Now, what was this all about? Tongues of fire. Sounds spooky, doesn't it? Tongues of fire. Well, according to Peter in Acts 2, verses 14 to 21, you want to get this reference down. The tongues of fire and the speaking in foreign languages or tongues. And declaring the mighty acts of God by the 120, watch this, was the sign or the warning or the portent to the Jewish people that the judgment of the nations had begun. Amen. In fact, this judgment would begin with the apostate nation of Israel and the house of God or the temple which had become an abomination. Fit only for destruction. Look at Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 14. But Peter, taking his stand, I love this, with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words, for these men are not drunk as you suppose. For it's only the third hour of the day. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. But this is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. Watch this now. He quotes the prophecy of Joel. And it shall be in the last days. Talking about the last days of old covenant Israel. In fact, what, what, he, what happened on the day of Pentecost was actually give, was the, the Spirit was poured out to bring an end to, old, to the old covenant nation. Now some of you just fell asleep that moment. <laughs> now, some of you think, oh no, I don't want to hear about that. The J word. Judgment. Look what he says. And it shall be in the last days, talking about the last days of Moses or of the old covenant uh, 
uh, uh, era. God says that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind or all flesh, all humanity. And your sons and your daughters will do what? Will do what? Will do what? Uh, is it fair to, uh, to, um, to understand then that the purpose of the outpouring of the Spirit or the gift of the Holy Spirit and speaking in languages and prophesying is to bring about God's purpose in the earth? And your young men shall see visions. In other words, the purpose of the outpouring of the Spirit is so that that you and I will prophesy, church. I'm not talking about being weird. I'm talking about declaring the mighty acts of God. Resulting in a harvest of souls. And releasing God's saving rule. His kingdom. His government in the earth. His righteous judgments. Can you say amen? Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. Underline that word prophesy. Turn to somebody and ask, are you prophesying? <laughs> no, don't do that. You'll, you may get slapped. <laughs> How I many you see that's what we ought to be doing? In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 14, Paul definitely says that he would that we all prophesy. Come on, church. Come on, church. I'm going to tell you some things this morning that some of you have never heard. To awaken us out of our charismatic stupor. And get us to engage our mission. Our calling and our destiny. So that we possess cities and nations. And fill the earth with the glory of God. So he says in verse 17 he says. I will pour out my spirit and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. And in verse 18 he says. I will in those days pour forth of my spirit and they shall prophesy. What will be the result of the prophesy? Come on. And I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood, fire, and vapor of smoke. In other words, the result of the prophesy will be the judgments of God released in the earth. Bringing forth a harvest of souls. Whole nations, cities and nations being converted and swept into the kingdom. And those that refuse being removed by fire. How many believe we need this? How many believe we need God to intervene in history today? Come on. We need God to get involved with our Congress in this country. We need God to get involved in the Middle East. What's he waiting on? He's waiting on the saints to prophesy. And release his kingdom purposes, his authority and power, his judgments into the earth. The sun will be turned into darkness. How many understand that, that uh, blood and fire and vapors of smoke? Everybody say, blood and fire and vapors of smoke. Blood, fire, and fire. This is a prophetic foreshadowing of the judgment that fell on Jerusalem in 70 A.D. When the Romans burned the city. I'm talking about with literal fire. And the temple was destroyed. I'm talking about literally destroyed. And the kingdom was taken from the apostate Jews and was given to the saints. Was given to the church. Saints, did you know you and I are 
the, the body of his kingdom purpose to disciple the nations and fill the earth with his glory? Hallelujah. We're not a bunch of nobodies. We are his fellow heirs. We are sons and daughters of the king and heirs and joint heirs. We partner with him in the work of governing cities and nations. And we do it through our prophesy. <laughs> Is this right, Shane? And it shall be that the, the sun will be turned into darkness, the moon into blood before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You and I need to remember this morning, church, that according to the prophets of Israel, the purpose of Messiah's kingdom would be to deal with the present evil age. To deal with the problem of evil. Destroy it. Remove it. In fact, Jesus came into the world to defeat the devil. To accomplish our redemption. To re receive his kingdom. To pour out the Holy Spirit in order to bring forth sons and daughters into the kingdom of God. And to anoint us with the gift of the Holy Spirit, with the very supernatural power of God. So that together with the Messiah we might prophesy and govern and judge the nations and fill all things with righteousness and with peace and with joy. Is this good? John the Baptist. Watch this now. I'm almost done. But really I, I, I have the sensing in my spirit. The reason the Lord set me on this course on Pentecost Sunday was so we would come to this hour. And what I'm saying to you today. Amen? Amen. I mean, the, the outpouring of the Spirit is not just to give you goosebumps. Or so you can dance a Holy Ghost jig. Or get off. Are you hearing me? The anointing of the Holy Ghost is to give you power to witness. To prophesy and release. To, to br a, a, a harvest of souls. And the judgment of fire. John the Baptist. I was trying to get to that. The last, watch this. The last and the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. Declared that the Messiah would baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Amen. He would harvest the nations. He would pour out the Spirit in order to harvest the nations. Gathering his wheat into his barn, his kingdom. And burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire of judgment. You see, the purpose of the baptism of the Spirit would be to baptize men and women into Jesus the Messiah for salvation. So that they might become sons and daughters of the kingdom. Receive the gift of the Spirit for power to speak in tongues or languages that they have not learned. And prophesy or bear witness to the nations that Jesus is the Messiah. God's anointed King. And that He is the, the ruler and the judge of all. The baptism of fire that John spoke of refers to the fire of judgment. And like the, the judgment that fell on apostate Israel in the temple in 70 AD. When the Romans burned Jerusalem with fire and tore down the temple stone by stone. In Luke chapter 12 verse 49. Nobody preaches on this verse. But it's a very important verse. Jesus declared, I have come to cast fire on the earth. 
And how I wish it were already kindled. Today, many Christians understand that Jesus is the Spirit Messiah. The wonderful Savior who baptizes us with the Holy Spirit into His body for salvation. And who gives us the gift of the, of the Spirit for kingdom power to enable us to work His works and live the life he lived. But they do not understand that Jesus is also the fire Messiah. The reigning king who rides the heavens today in judgment, pouring out fire on all who refuse his offer of mercy and grace in salvation and destroying wicked or evil men and their systems that oppress the poor and slaughter the innocent. Thus just as John prophesied and just as God the Father promised, the Spirit was poured out on the day of Pentecost. The disciples were all filled with the Holy Spirit and power and they began to speak in foreign languages that they had not learned. And they began to prophesy or proclaim the mighty acts of God. Saints, this was not something freaky or weird or abnormal. This was the pattern. This was the norm. This was the rule. This was the standard of apostolic Christianity. Now watch. The, the people who hear them say, what is this? They don't understand what's going on. And so Peter stands up, watch, and interprets the languages. And he prophesies. The will and the purpose of God. Proclaiming the gospel of the king. Warning of, of, of pending judgment that would fall in 70 A.D. And proclaiming, that's in the, the, the prophecy of Joel, verses 16 through 21. And then he proclaims the gospel of the king. Watch this. Exposing the hearts of his fellow Jews and judging them. Wow, church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Convicted. They cry out, what must we do to be saved from the fire of judgment that's coming on our wicked generation? Saints, this is exactly what Jesus had commanded Peter and the others in Acts chapter 1. Turn to Acts chapter 1 quickly. I'm going to be about five minutes. Are you okay? I've got to finish this. I don't want to come back to this on Father's Day. I want to preach something good on Father's Day. <laughs> I think this is good. Hallelujah. Look at Acts 2, uh, Acts uh, uh, 1. Acts 1. Where am I? Verse 4. This is Jesus speaking. Gathering them together, talking about Peter and the uh, other apostles. He commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised. Let I me mean, see, he commands them to wait on the gift of the Holy Spirit. How many of you see that? Wave at me if you see that. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now look at verse 8. But you will receive what? Say it again. Power. Say it again. Power. Say it louder. Power. Shout it out. Power. But you will receive power yes. when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses. Watch this. In Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. Now stop reading. The book of Acts 
and the rest of the entire New Testament is about the fulfillment of the commission that Jesus gave Peter and those other apostles in Acts chapter 1. They were to go throughout the Roman Empire, beginning in Jerusalem, then to Judea, then to Samaria, then to the uttermost parts of the Roman Empire. And in the power of the Spirit, they were to preach the gospel of the kingdom and bear witness of Jesus' kingship. They were to testify, not only for Jesus, bearing witness of him, but against the Jews. For, for what they had done. The Holy Spirit empowered them, church, to speak in tongues, languages they hadn't learned, and to prophesy or proclaim the gospel of the kingdom in demonstration of the Spirit's power. In other words, they worked miracles throughout the Roman Empire. What were they doing? They were gathering the believing remnant of the Jews and the first fruits of the Gentile nations and raising up the Lord's church, the new covenant Israel, in order to bring an end to the old covenant age. To gather a harvest of Jews and Gentiles and build the church and release the righteous judgments of God upon apostate Israel who had rejected the Messiah who had handed him over to lawless men to the, to, to the Romans to crucify him and then who had rejected his witnesses persecuting his apostles and his saints doing despite to the spirit of mercy and grace and trampling under their feet the blood of salvation and as a consequence in 70 A.D., they themselves became a trampling ground for the nations. Church, the Father, hear me as I close. The Father has given all judgment to the Son. 